Anything? asked Yarrow. Nothing, said Abrov. Yarrow licked Kvasa from his lips and took another swig from the canteen before passing it to his lieutenant. Not like Misha to run late, Abrov muttered before he too sipped from the flask. Yarrow breathed in deeply before shaking his head. Abrov was right. The scoutmaster should have been back by now. Double the watch, he said, and keep an eye out for any signs of foul play. Abrov raised a brow. You suspect treachery? Perhaps. It is just as likely that Misha was delayed by the storm. Yarrow frowned, not quite believing his own words. Or one of his prospects got lost, but it's best we prepare for the worst. A lowered guard is an open invitation for failure. Kurov's words echoed in his mind. I'll set the men to it, said Abrov, wiping Kavasa from his beard with the sleeve of his coat before stalking off back to the camp. Yarrow's eyes drifted to the woods, to the dense blackness of Noloth Forest. Barely visible beneath the winter moon, a ragged outline of trees spread from the base of the Iron Pass and into the snowfields beyond. The Hussar camp lay sprawled out across the mouth of the pass, hundreds of tents deployed in a tight circular formation that culminated on the edge of the forest. No fires were lit this night. They were too close to the pillars to risk the warmth of an open flame. Shapes moved in the murk, and the earthly grunts of the Akashans drifted over the camp. Yarrow could just make out Bellis's figure moving between the tents, his shoulders hunched against the cold. He drained the last of his kvasa and thrust his hands into his coat and began the short walk back to the camp. Bellis frowned. And if they don't return, we continue as planned. Yarrow pressed a hand through Samara's fur and glanced up at Bellis. With caution. The lieutenant flicked a chunk of meat at Duke, who snatched it out of the air between his powerful jaws. We're being baited in, he said, turning to Yarrow. Misha's delay does not sit well with me. They would have hit us in the pass if this were a trap. Yarrow furrowed his brow and stared back at the open mouth of the Black Mountain. Least that's what I would have done. Limit our maneuverability. Cut the claws off from one another. Cut us down from the slopes above. Like fish in a battle. Bellis nodded before a grin split his face. It'd take balls to ambush an entire regiment of hussars, though. Or stupidity. Yarrow smiled back, but the motion felt strained. Arrogance is weakness, Kurov always used to say. As much a weakness as a broken sword. Sumera nestled her head against his palm, forcing him to rub her brow as she pushed at him impatiently. Her amber-flecked eyes shone with inhuman intelligence, even in the half-light. She could sense his discomfort and his uncertainty. The king's word is law. Your honor is your duty. If only it were that simple. Yarrow stiffened as the flap of his tent was drawn open, his eyes quickly adjusting to the morning light. Sounds of the camp drifted in through the canvas, angry shouts in the distance, heavy boots running between the tents. What is it? he said, his hand moving to his sword. He relaxed as Alina's face appeared in the opening. News of the scouts? Yarrow pushed himself up from his bedroll and rested on his elbows. Alina shook her head, her thin eyebrows arching as she pursed her lips. The camp was breached during the night. We lost Huska and Sander. Their throats were slit before they could raise the alarm. She paused for a moment, grinding her teeth as she stared at Yarrow. They took your fop. Yarrow groaned, his chest feeling heavy with the doubts of the night before, and now with anger. For a moment, in that dim space between sleep and wakefulness, he'd felt at ease. Now those fears and suspicions came racing back to meet him. To attempt such a feat spoke of courage and meticulous planning. To get away with it spoke of something else entirely. Anyone else missing? His words were sharp as he got to his feet. Just Thelus and that stupid horse of his. They must have known exactly where he was. The rest of the camp went untouched. Yarrow swore. Where's Bellus? He tightened the buckle of his belt grimly before sliding his sword into his sheath. He took a party out once we figured out what had happened, said Alina. There was more snow during the night. Yarrow sighed. Without Misha and his scouts, finding Thelus would be near impossible. Who was in charge last night? He spat out the question, though he already knew the answer. Elena's face reddened, but her eyes glared at him. She was as hard as stone, and about as unbending, but he could see the shame in her eyes, and in the way her shoulders slumped. I did as instructed. There were a dozen guards and patrols throughout the night. I don't know how they got through. They knew of our coming. Yarrow's tone softened as he stepped out of the tent. He couldn't blame her for this. They'd all been caught unawares. Count on the improbable. He wondered what his old captain would have thought of this. 
very little, in all likelihood, he'd have been stripped of his rank and thrown into the black cells for a night, maybe longer. Kurov had never been one for forgiveness. How? Lina frowned, brushing loose wisps of hair out of her eyes. A traitor in the king's court, said Yaro. His mind was racing. Behan's own advisor, a lord of the court. He should have seen it coming. Should have known. He gritted his teeth. There would be time for that later. Assemble the regiment, he said, moving briskly across the camp. We must move quickly. We'll find Bellus on the way. The black mountains fell behind them like ghostly shadows disappearing into a haze of fog and snow. The regiment moved with speed, hurtling over the frozen ground, flickering in and out between the gnarled limbs of the ancient trees and white-tipped branches that hung over their heads. Crows wheeled in the sky above, a slow-moving circle of black and white that tracked the hussars as they ploughed through the snow. The harsh screeches of the birds snatched Yarrow back to that settlement in Vorgar. Zedets, was it? It mattered little. He'd seen a dozen like it. Mud walls and hungry faces, white eyes and angry men. Bellus had bested their champion in single combat, split his head in two before anyone had time to blink. They joked about it at the time, their spirits lifted after the perils of the campaign. And then the king had come. He'd boasted and bragged at the might of his favoured regiment, at their courage and honour, and then he'd made them torch the place. Caught without shelter in the heart of winter, the people would perish, but he hadn't cared, and Yara had done what he was told. A dog at his heels, ready at his beck and call. There'd been no joking after that. Yarrow buckled on his chestplate as they rode, his practiced hand moving nimbly across the buckles. His eyes darted out from behind the narrow slits of the visor that had replaced his Ushanka, monitoring the progress of his claws. They were on a war footing now, and the companies were splayed out across the forest like the fingers of an open hand. Far enough from one another to cover the ground, but close enough to form a fist when required. Yaro rode at the head of the Urin's Fang, beside Abrov and Alina. There, called Alina, pointing through the canopy to a set of shadows moving between the trees. Yaro grunted and steered Sumera toward the emerging figures of Bellus and the search party. His second's face was grim when he joined them, but there was fire in his eyes. The thick haft of his hammer rested across his knees, and his thumb tapped out a frustrated rhythm against the wood. Thelus? Yarrow asked, waving the claw forward. No sign of him. Bellus met his eyes and shook his head sadly. We found Misha and his scouts, butchered like sheep at the edge of the forest. Yarrow scowled. And the prospects? Them too. It was arrows that did it for him, the cowards. He spat into the snow. Didn't even have the courage to face boys in a fair fight. May Odin guide them through the deep night, said Abrov, thumping his fist against his chestplate. The old man's eyes flickered for a moment, before steel returned. We will have blood for this. A debt of blood can only be settled in kind. Kurov had known that better than anyone, but it hadn't saved him. And what of the pillars, said Yarrow? Any sign of Behan's traitors, or has this all been in vain? Bellus's frown deepened. We made it as far as the tree line, but it doesn't take Misha's keen eyes to see that there's been troop movement beyond the forest. Numbers? More than ours, if I had to guess. Disposition? Footmen, some light cavalry. Bellus curled his lips in disgust. And the bowmen that got Misha and his lot. Yarrow nodded as he digested the information. The rebellion had outmaneuvered the throne, outthought the brightest minds at King Behan's disposal. They'd said it wasn't possible that the rabble led by this pauper prince was already falling apart. And yet they'd managed to cross into loyalist territory. They'd managed to make a mockery of the king's own regiment. If we move through... Abrov cleared his throat noisily. With respect, Captain. He paused, waiting for Yara's nod before he continued. Our objective was compromised the moment Thelis was taken. Whoever is waiting for us will know our numbers by now, if they didn't before, and will be well prepared. They've planned this from the start. From capturing Thelus to our very being here, there being a step ahead. Bellus thumped the head of his hammer with a fist and gave a disapproving growl. We swore an oath, an oath to the throne, to the king! What will you have us do? Run back to the city with our tails between our legs? Bah! He exhaled deeply, his hands balling into fists by his sides. They've taken the fop. They've killed Misha. Surely that must come for something. Yarrow raised a hand, ending Bellus's tirade before it turned into something else. Bellus is right. You both are. His eyes shifted from Bellus to Abrov, before coming to a rest on the path ahead. 
but we have no choice in the matter. There is no telling what chaos this force would sow if left unchecked. He sighed gruffly and stretched his back out in his saddle. Besides, there is the matter of Lord Veron. If we were to return without him, I fear our fates would be as dire as his. Bellus clapped his hands together, a thin grin on his scarred face. Honor demands it. Our king demands it. Abrov raised a thick, grey brow and sighed. So be it. He inclined his head to Yarrow and pushed his mount forward, toward the head of the claw. He's too cautious for his own good, said Bellus with a shake of his head. Age has made him tread softly, where once he would have fought to be heard. Still, Yarrow tugged at Sumera's reins, following after the lieutenant. He may be proven right. The four pillars jutted out of the earth like angry boils on a leper's face, black teeth against a white sky. Gods, they were tall. Yarrow sped across the upturned soil and snow, muddy channels formed by a far larger force, his eyes darting from left to right as they closed on the pillars. His people knew them by other names. God's Peaks, the Shattered Spire. Legends had formed around the stone towers, myths and fables that changed with each telling, songs that sung of their god's greatest battle. Udin had fought the deep night here, battling Father Death for the heart of the world. The battle had seemed lost when, with his final breath, Udin plunged his spear into Father Death, shattering the weapon into four pieces, pushing back the deep night. But none can beat back Father Death forever, not even a god. Now he comes only when the earth goes coldest, a shadowed figure in the edge of winter, a scavenger in the darkest nights. Wind whipped across the snow, swirling the heavy rain that buffeted them from the east. Urin bellowed in the heavens above, his call a vicious roll of thunder that made Yarrow shiver. This is how it must have been during the breaking, when Urin cast his might against the cunning of Father Death. He could feel the cold ache in his bones, his flesh made numb by the icy gale. He gripped his sword tighter until his knuckles began to ache. He had once thought there nothing better than iron in his hands and the thrill of charging into battle. Bellus still felt that thrill, even after so many years. His face shone with the joy of war, of fighting back the deep night. He glanced at Yarrow, his eyes twinkling from beneath his half-helm as he shifted his hammer across his shoulder. The claws had left the cover of Nolith Forest behind, the brooding black points of the pillars racing up to meet them. The Yachenko twins had taken their companies east, looking to circle round from behind the furthest spire. Urkbart had cut west, his bone claws climbing up the steps of the steep rock face. They'd move in like a pincer, the finishing blow coming from the center, from Yarrow's sword. There! Bellus called out over the howling wind. He nodded to the narrow corridor between the closest pillars. In the distance, on the open field, in the center of the towering edifices, a splash of color. Banners unfurling, and steel flashing in the cold light. Someone was shouting behind him, but he couldn't hear the words. A glint of steel brought his eyes back to the easternmost spire. Urkbot's company was reeling against the steps, forced back by flights of arrows from above. Nimble-footed spearmen grappled with the stone walls, holding tight as they poked down at the hussars with their longer weapons. Bellus was right. They'd been baited in. Bring them back. He turned to Abrov and pointed with his sword at the horn strapped across the lieutenant's belt. Before we lose more men. Abrov nodded and drew the horn to his lips, breathing in deeply before blasting into the mouthpiece. The sound cut through the wind, through the storm and rain. It was a sorrowful note, one seldom heard by the hussars. It echoed between the pillars, and the bone claws began to pull back. We'll move up on the center, Yarrow snarled into the rain, spitting mist into the sky. See if they can take us on even ground. Bellus caught the corner of his coat and wiped moisture from Widower's grip. We'll have to rush them to get to the bowmen. He rested his hammer against the shoulder and stared out at the field of color moving between the pillars. I reckon it's just footmen. Long spears, though. Still, they'll crumble once we move against them. Yarrow followed his second's gaze, staring across the snow-strewn land, stark white beneath the reds and yellows of the force arrayed before them. They were still too distant to make out any detail, but he thought he could see the outlines of squares forming from the ranks. A wall of spears would be waiting for their charge, and arrows would pepper them as they moved over the field. This will be a test, said Bellus, his eyes gleaming at the promise of it. But Urin is with us. He urges us on with his calls. He bellows for vengeance. He'll have his vengeance. Yarrow rubbed a hand over his plated helm as the wind picked up, his eyes tracking the formation as it moved through the pillows. Vengeance. The word turned sour in his mouth. 
He'd seen enough of it for one lifetime, maybe more. Men swore sacred oaths in its name and groveled before it like any other god. He'd seen great men fall because of it. He'd nearly done so himself. Kurov's death had triggered a rage in him that only blood could sate, and yet he'd never given himself fully to it. He remembered the rage then, the anger. But his duty had come first. It drew the rage out of him like poison from a wound. Bellis frowned toward the jagged rocks. Yeah, thank you, Stolabs. They went through a lot of trouble just to get him out of our camp. Yarrow rubbed warmth into his legs, grunting as the blood pulsed through his cold veins. They want him for some reason, else they'd just have killed him in his tent. They'd be interrogating him now, before spiriting him away toward the eastern cities. Thelus was by the king's ear. He'd have much to say once he cracked. Which he would, as sure as the setting of the sun and the coming of the deep night. The field before them was as flat as the surface of Yarrow's blade. The four pillars rose up around it, as imposing up close as they were from afar. Tufts of grass stuck up from beneath the snow, clinging desperately to life, even in the face of the odds. Yarrow stared up at the shattered spires, imagining the size and strength of the god who had once wielded such a weapon. A story for children, perhaps, but it gave him comfort still. Fitting that a battle between the soldiers of these new gods should happen here. Here, where Urin had fought back the Deep Night, beat back Father Death himself. He drew his eyes down, out from the myths and songs, and to the hard reality that faced them. They were outnumbered. A dozen banners from a dozen regiments, reds and blues, oranges and greens, golds and yellows, bold as the emblems that fluttered above their heads. The Kraken of Hess, the Hammer of Elmsden, the Lion of Rothenburg. And why shouldn't they be? They held the field and outnumbered the Hussars three to one. Yarrow scanned their lines, his eyes narrowing as he counted the halberdiers and crossbowmen amidst their ranks. This was no peasant army, no motley collection of the downtrodden. Elena growled, reading his thoughts. So much for an enemy on the brink of defeat. They'll fall just the same, said Bellus. He thumbed the grip of his hammer and bared his teeth in a vicious smile. Abrov will be coming round from the flank soon. What say we join him in the middle? Yarrow stared around him, into the faces of his regiment. He could feel Simera's eagerness for battle beneath him, her muscles tensing as she rolled her head back and forth. Her eagerness was shared by the other Akashans, and a dull rumble had started to ripple out from the mouths of the black bears. Their riders felt it too. A nervous wave of energy that passed through their ranks, silent to the grunts of their mounts, but no less deadly. The time for talk has ended. Cold steel was the answer now. An Akushan bear in full sprint is a sight to behold. A thousand pounds of black fur and hardened muscle hurtling toward you, crushing anything in its path as its massive jaws engulf your vision and splinter-sharp claws block out the sun. Add to this the fact that the rider on its back wants nothing more than to see you wipe from existence and you've got the makings of a full rout, most of the time. The men of the rebellion were proving to be one of those irritating exceptions. They gripped their weapons tight and muttered prayers to their gods, but they did not retreat. Sumera devoured the ground beneath her, hurtling them across the field with the speed few could match. Her giant pads flattened the snow, splaying out as they dug into the hard soil below before launching her forward. Yarrow drew his sword and lifted it above his head, waving his men toward the bunched up line on the edge of the field. His doubts started to fade, the certainty of war clearing up the thoughts that had clouded his mind. Here was an answer to every question, at the point of his blade and along the sharpened ridges of his sword. His muscles felt better than they had in months, and the dull ache of his bones faded away into nothingness. He spurred Sumera onward, urging her to greater feats of speed as they raced toward the line. Black bolts shot out from scores of archers hidden behind the spear wall ahead. Yarrow was forced to duck down as they shot over his head, but many of them found their mark. Bestial roars echoed across the field as the Akashans were pelted with arrows, but it only amplified their rage. A strangled yelp sounded from behind him, but he didn't see who it came from. Riders began to slip from their saddles as the marksmen shifted their aim, moving to the thinner hides of the hussars themselves. They'd left it too late. Yarrow braced in his saddle as the spear wall loomed ahead. He could see the eyes of the men who manned it now, their fears reflected back at him as Sumera bounded toward them. Still, they held leveraging their spears against the ground as they readied for impact. 
The Kraken banner rose above their heads, its black and gold resplendent against the white of winter. Men of Hess, then. They had never seen an Akashan fight before. He could see it in the way they squared themselves, as if they were fending off a cavalry charge. The butts of their spears were planted firmly into the ground beneath their feet, while the second rank pressed up against the first, lending them the support of their own poor weapons. He sped a glance to his right, and spotted the grin spread out across Bellus' face. He'd noticed it too. This would be over before it began. For the king! Yarrow shouted, digging his heels into Sumeru's flanks as the two lines met. Except it didn't. Sumera slowed her charge at the last moment, dragging her paws deep into the snow as she reared up over the spear wall. There was a brief pause as spears swept out into the empty air. They would have carved a cavalry charge into pieces, spitting horses and riders alike, but the hussars did not fight like cavalry. Sumera bellowed out a hissing roar and slammed her massive claws into the waiting spears. She swiped left and right, splitting the wall apart as broken wood and glinting steel fell into the snow. A panicked cry rose up over the rebels as the incident was repeated across the line, but it was not over yet. Sumera brought her front paws to the ground again with a thump and slammed into the now-defunct spear wall. Screams were torn out of the men closest to her, but cut short as she barreled into them. Yarrow slammed his sword down into the chest of a screaming Hessian, breaking another's face with the pommel of his sword as they plunged deeper into the formation. He slashed down into the melee from above, protecting Sumera's flanks from anyone that got in his way. Duke waded in beside them, his maw already drenched with the blood of his victims. The monstrous Akashan rumbled out an unearthly growl and snapped his massive fangs around the waist of the nearest spearman, ending his screams with the squeeze of his jaws. Bellus's hammer reaped a bloody harvest from above, his brawny shoulders rolling in fluid circular motions as he sent broken bodies sprawling in his wake. Hundreds died in those first few moments, falling beneath a wave of black fur and steel as the hussars drove a wedge deep into their lines. Yarrow fended off a clumsy spear thrust and lashed out with his boot, catching a spearman in the throat. The man spluttered out a groan as he clutched at his neck, before falling back into the tight press. He risked a glance along the line, trusting in Sumera to keep him from harm. The Hessians had started to waver, their courage broken, now that the Hussars had unleashed their fury upon them. Take the banner! Bellus roared. He pushed forward, swinging madly with his hammer at the scrambling figures below. The spearmen were falling back now, their long pole weapons proving ineffectual in such close quarters. They moved in a clump around the Kraken banner, hoping their numbers would provide some reprieve from the onslaught. Short swords and daggers appeared in their shaking hands, all but useless against the thick pelts of the Akashans. Yarrow clenched his jaw as another wave of steel-tipped shafts sliced through the air, punching through armor, forcing the hussars low in their saddles. He glanced up in time to see Bellus lead the charge into the heaving mass, buffeting aside those brave enough to meet him and laying waste to those who fled. He turned away from the skirmish, the results already a foregone conclusion, and scanned the conflict for a sign of the bowmen. The field had become a seething throng of struggling men. Those Hessians who had survived the initial charge fought on grimly, but the hussars were proving to be a force beyond their reckoning. Still, they fought on. Even now, new skirmish lines were forming behind the initial spear wall. Hundreds of piercing blades were lowered at the Akashans, but it was to no avail. Each new line was broken down within moments, leaving dozens of soldiers cast out in the open, where the hussars ran them down mercilessly. A unit of halberdiers, hardened veterans by the look of them, had formed a square in the centre of the latest skirmish line. They were meeting with more success, pushing back the Akashans, even as their ranks were decimated. Yarrow spat out a curse as he saw the hunched figures of the arbalists moving between the halberdiers. They shot black death at the hussars, before crouching down behind the safety of the halberds to reload. Only a coward wields a crossbow in place of a sword. Yarrow motioned forward to the hussars that rode beside him, gripping his bloodied sword tighter as they closed in on the veterans. He spotted Alina from the corner of his eye, a determined mask set upon her face. The halberdiers closed ranks, spotting the hussars moving against them. They leveled their halberds, the first row of them held at the hips, while the second line shifted the pole arms above their shoulders, waving them into the air above their heads. They'd seen what the hussars could do to a packed spear line. The same trick would not work on them. Here was a test now, a worthy foe for the swords of the hussars, for the song weavers of Kunsk. Yarrow shifted in his saddle, tensing his shoulders as Sumera moved across the snow, picking up speed as they closed the space between the veterans. A halberd arced for Yarrow's head, but he managed to turn it aside with a deft swipe of his blade. A spear screeched a lion across his cuirass, to which he lashed out with his sword, cutting the offending pole in two. 
Then they were on them. Sumera claimed the first kill, cleaving her claws through the neck of one of the halberdiers, shearing through armor, ribs, and flesh, spraying everyone with arterial blood. Yarrow drove his sword through the body of a wild-eyed spearman, impaling him before he kicked out with his boot, knocking the man backwards to the ground. Another of the halberdiers was hacked down by Alina's frenzied swipes as Warcheck barged into their ranks, his own fangs plunging deep into the chest of a wailing spearman. The hussar to Yarrow's flank was dragged kicking from his mount, his sword waving uselessly in the air, before his great accussion turned on the assailant, scattering the halberdiers with a single swipe of her paw. Another leapt on the downed rider's chest, straddling him as he stabbed down with a sharp dagger, puncturing the hussar's helm before he slammed the blade into his exposed neck. A gargantuan paw smashed into the side of the halberdier's head, breaking his neck and knocking him off the hussar's chest. The Akushan stepped in front of a downed rider to protect him from further blows, but it was too late. The hussar lay motionless in the snow, a pool of blood spreading beneath him. His mount bellowed out mournfully, the cry quickly turning into a deep roar, even as glaives and halberds punched into her thick pelt. Yarrow pulled frantically on Sumera's reins, drawing her away from the bear and her rider. He'd seen it before, more times than he cared to remember. The same scene played out a dozen times in his mind. He knew what was coming. The bond between Akashin and Hussar could only be broken by the deep night, and woe to anyone who brought about such a thing. The black bear shrugged off a deluge of panicked blows and rose up onto her hind legs, slapping aside the pole weapons. The halberdiers doubled down on their assault, sensing the peril they were in, but the Akashin seemed unaffected by the wounds they inflicted upon her. With another hateful roar, the bear slammed its paws into the ground and charged forward. Bones shattered beneath her flailing claws, halberdiers bowled over and crushed beneath her weight, their flesh torn apart. Horrible screams rent the air as she yanked spearmen from the ground, bent plate mail out of shape, and ripped men apart with her claws. A bloody mist seemed to follow her as she dug deeper into the skirmish line, striking out with unmitigated fury at those who had seen her rider dead. The veterans began to buckle, their well-organized center disintegrating under the wrath of the vengeful bear, but their flanks fought on. Yarrow swiped down at a swordsman in the red and yellow of Elmsden, his blade flashing once, then twice as he disarmed him, before burying it in the man's chest. Another appeared before him, his mouth open in a wordless battle cry, but Alina knocked him down with a single blow to the head. They won't give in, she said, unleashing another flurry of attacks on a pikeman who tried to flank her. The man dropped to his knees, already dead by the time his face hit the snow. Yarrow tilted his head as a new sound rose above the battlefield a low rumble that grew louder and more pressing as he listened, like drums beating in the depths. Thunder, then, but not from the heavens above, not from Urin's bellows, but from hundreds of hooves slamming into the densely packed earth. He saw Alina's eyes go wide and spun around to see a wall of flesh and steel bearing down on them. Heavy destriers heaved out great gusts of mist as their armoured riders urged them on. Iron-tipped lancers already poised for impact. Pendants waved in the air, great banners unfurling as their riders bounded toward them. A single warhorn blared across the field, and then another, until the entire world seemed to echo one fell note. Yarrow caught a glimpse of green and gold, a three-headed serpent coiled around an iron spear. Lancers. Reform! Reform! He bellowed as he turned to face the charge. The nearest hussars quickly untangled from the heaving mass of bodies, but others had been caught between the spearmen's skirmish lines. They lashed out in rage, pummeling through swathes of men to face this new threat, but it was in vain. Their host, emboldened by the appearance of reinforcements, fought with renewed vigor, throwing themselves at the hussars with reckless abandon. Yarrow glanced along the line to his right. He could see his hussars turning frantically to meet the charge, but they were too slow. The lancers were almost upon them, the savage rhythm of their horses bringing them closer with every second. They'd have to meet them, or else be crushed between them and the reforming skirmish lines. With me! Yarrow shouted, urging Sumera toward the thundering cavalry. A ragged line of hussars rode up beside him, almost half their number still grappling with the skirmish lines. It would have to be enough. He felt his heart pounding in his ears, his blood churning hot and heavy as rage coursed through him. Lancers. With a scream of steel and broken bones, the two lines met. A dozen accussions were skewered by the iron-tipped lancers, their death cries wretched as they flung their riders into the tumult. Several more were crushed beneath the flailing hooves of the heavy chargers, their bones a shattered mess. Destriers were dragged into the snow as jaws locked around their legs and necks, their eyes rolling in terror as they were torn apart. Yarrow saw Alina cave in the skull of a rider, Warchek's massive jaws clamped around the head of his destrier before they both disappeared into the press.
Sumera swatted aside a lance aimed for her neck and ploughed into the cavaliers, knocking over destriers and tearing through flesh with her claws. Yarrow ducked beneath a swinging axe and slashed out with his sword, catching a lancer on the side before pushing further into their lines. The impetus of the charge had faltered. The momentum that had brought the two lines together dissolved into a series of individual battles that stretched across the field. Yarrow fell into a steady rhythm, his blade weaving a deadly pattern of silver and red, humming through the air and screaming in glee as it carved through steel armor and pink flesh. But for every lancer he dispatched, another would appear, roaring out the words of their god, their battle cries, and then their death knells as Yarrow cut them down. He traded blows with a raven-haired cavalier, her blindingly fast reposts forcing him on the defensive. He waited for his chance, deftly turning aside attacks that would have left another rider a riddled mess of open cuts and punctured armor. It came a moment later. She overreached, swinging her sword and a vicious arc at his head, leaving her side exposed. Yarrow leaned forward in his saddle and stabbed at the opening, plunging his blade deep into her side. Blood erupted from the wound as he wrenched his sword out, ready to finish her with a backhanded swing. The lancer wrestled with her reins, pulling her destrier away from him even as he surged forward. His finishing blow missed her by an inch, and then she was gone, back into the heaving mass of loyalists and traitors. From out of the thrum of battle, Yarrow heard Bellis's roar as he charged into the lancers, having finally disengaged from the skirmish lines. Duke crashed into a trio of the cavaliers, spitting them out and moving on to the next, his colossal bulk forcing low even the sturdiest of destriers. Bellus beat out a song of blood and carnage with Widower, buckling armor and bones beneath the hammer as he rode, leaving a trail of death in his wake. The lancers moved in force against him, seeing the threat he posed, and tried to hem him in. The lieutenant shrugged them off, swinging his hammer in great circles as they closed, before throwing himself at the nearest cavalier, tackling him off his horse and onto the ground. Duke, relieved of his rider, leapt into the dense thicket of lances, tipping horses over and smashing away at the cavaliers with tooth and claw. Bellus rose beside the great Akashan and continued his attack on foot, sweeping the legs out from beneath the horses and breaking skulls beneath his hammer. Urin would be pleased, said Alina, riding up beside Yarrow. Her face was wet with sweat and blood, and it looked like someone had smashed a fist into her nose. Yarrow nodded and turned back to the thick lines arrayed against them, letting his regiment push forward without his sword for the moment. The skirmish lines were reforming to their flank. Urkbart's bone claws were keeping them out of the fight for the time being, but they'd need to be reinforced before the spearmen took advantage of their greater numbers. If not, they risked being whittled down from both sides. Yarrow cursed, spitting black words at the heavens above, cursing at Urin and every other god he could name. He didn't have the men. He removed his silver helm and wiped the sweat from his eyes. The ache had started to return, the adrenaline that had pumped through his veins dissipating as fatigue crept in. The appearance of the Iron Lancers had thrown his battle plans into disarray, and what should have been a one-sided fight had turned into a bloody brawl. He watched as a hussar was brought down, his accushion crumbling to the ground beneath a barrage of lance and sword strikes. The rider was dispatched shortly thereafter, a sword thrust between the armor of his neck and collarbone, sending him into the deep night. He saw Bellus hurl himself at the cavaliers, howling in rage as he lost himself to his own battle frenzy. Duke thundered beside him, sending cavalier and charger alike flying through the air with each great sweep of his claws. Still more of the hussars were brought down, crushed beneath trampling hooves, impaled by sword and lance, and slaughtered as the cavaliers reformed and charged back into them like the ebb and flow of the tide. Every moment that passed diminished the likelihood of a victory. He could feel it now, a tightness of his chest, a slight tremor in his hand. They would fail here, before the great spires of their god, before Udin's eyes and the eyes of these new gods. They couldn't hold off against such numbers, not caught between the angry spears of the skirmish lines and the cavaliers. They needed something, a single moment to shift the tide in their favor. A flash of color caught his eyes, and he stared hard into the sprawling mess of bodies. A grin spread across his face as the green and gold of the Lancer banner rose above them. Yarrow saw a white plume upon a golden helm, a grey-bearded warrior bedecked in intricate silver armor. A man who could only be the commander of the lancers. Then he was gone, hidden from sight by a blizzard of flailing arms and legs as the press closed around him. Find me the men I need to take that. Yarrow nodded to Alina, his sword pointed toward the lancer banner. With a shout, Yarrow ordered the hussars forward, spearing toward the heart of the melee, to the bellowing banner of the iron lancers. They thundered into the cavalier's line, and Yarrow cut a grisly path through the vanguard. A man spun off his horse, screaming in pain as Abrov drove on beside him, 
A lance was wrenched from the hands of another before he met his end at the tip of Alina's sword. Yarrow's blade gleamed coldly as he went about the murderous task, cutting and stabbing his way closer to the banner. He turned his head from side to side, glancing along the wedge. The hussars were surging forward, pushing deep into the densely packed centre of the lancers. With me! Yarrow bellowed, urging Sumero on. For the throne! He slammed a fist into a gawping face, kicked out at a cavalier that fell in his way, and then they were through, into the bannermen. The cavaliers reeled back, their lines split in two as the hussars pummeled them. They had a moment, perhaps, before the lancers reasserted themselves and cut them off from the rest of the regiment. Yaru spotted the gold helm and white plume moving ahead of him, snaking a trail behind the panicked banner bearers. He pressed on, hoping his hussars would follow him into the breach. Hooves flashed over his head, missing him by a hair as a grey destrier reared up in panic, screaming in fear before Duke tackled it to the ground. Bellus's grinning face was beside him then, swinging madly from Duke's back. Tight spot, he roared over the clash of steel and bellowing accussions. Been in the worse, replied Yarrow, a thin smile on his face. Bellus grunted. From Vorgar to Akasha, they'd fought side by side. First as prospects, then as initiates, and finally as lieutenants. Now Yarrow commanded the regiment, but their brotherhood remained. Not so sure about that, Bellus heaved out a ragged breath before rolling his hands along the haft of Widower as another group of lancers raced toward them. Till the end then, he glanced at Yarrow, his smile fading as he lifted his hammer. Aye, said Yarrow, to the end. He swung out at the first of the lancers, knocking aside his pole weapon before Sumera brought the horse down, crushing the rider beneath it. Bellus reaped a bloody toll, turning bone to mash and steel to broken plate, but his swings were growing heavier, his breathing laboured. They didn't have much left in them. Yara caught a glimpse of black armour and steel closing in from their flanks, encircling them as the white-plumed helm bobbed just out of reach, protected by a bodyguard of elite lancers. Golden shields with the green, hissing effigy of the serpent, black knights bedecked in thick plates of armour. Yaro felt despair as he realised none of his hussars would be making the ride back home. One more, said Bellus, glaring at the circle of iron that had formed around them. One more, Yaro agreed. He clambered down Sumeru's side, putting his feet on the frozen ground for the first time in what felt like ages. She grumbled low as he ran a hand through her fur, feeling the newly formed cuts and welts beneath his fingers. They wouldn't heal. She wouldn't live long enough for that. Yaro? Bella stared at him, confusion written on his face as he pointed at the wall of black armor. Yaro turned his head, his frown deepening as the golden-helmed commander rode toward them, a single escort by his side. He could kill him now. Send Samara charging into the commander's bodyguard as he cut the man down, avenging their lives before they were ended. A single bodyguard wouldn't stop him, not now that he had nothing left to lose. It would be a great blow to the rebellion, and Yarrow would die knowing his death was not totally in vain. His breath caught in his mouth as he got a proper look at the man riding beside the commander. He may have replaced his riding breeches for plate armor, his black cloak for a white shield, and his golden rings for a knight's gauntlets, but it was the same man. As pale as the first day they met, Thelus Varon smiled down at him from atop his gangly horse. Ah, Captain, he said with a flourish. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting. The last of his hope was drained from him as he heard the words. He stared up into Thelus' face, willing it not to be so, hoping for a sign that this was all some great mistake. But he saw nothing, just the twinkle of the man's eyes and the spreading of his grin. Bastard, Bellus sneered from behind him. Treacherous, murdering bastard. Now, now, said Thelus, turning to the lieutenant. There's no need for that. I have only done what I must, as of you. All this? Yarrow waved a hand at the battle still raging beyond the wall that surrounded them. You've led good men and women to their deaths and broken sacred oaths. You've betrayed your king. He spat into the snow as anger started to course through him, boosting tired muscles and pushing away the pain that racked his bones. Thelus raised a brow and ran a tongue along his lips before shaking his head. He is no king of mine. How could he be, when he leaves half his empire to starve and forces those that remain to fight in wars half a world away? It is Behan who has betrayed us. He betrays his people. Can you not see it? I suppose you worship these gods of theirs too, said Bellus with a hiss. I do, as would you, if you truly understood the faith. False words and false gods, said Yarrow softly, almost in a whisper. And now you've come to mock us before setting your dogs on us. The smile slowly faded from Thelus's face, his brows knitting together as he tilted his head. Not quite, 
I've come to kill you. He drew the sword from his side and held it before him, studying the blade before glancing back at Yarrow. If you accept my challenge? Bellus laughed loud and hard, the sound carrying over even the clash of swords and the screams of dying men. <laughs> you challenge a captain of the Hussars! He wiped the spittle from his face with a sleeve. You can add fool to your list of flaws, traitor. Thelus shrugged. Not even the plates of steel could hide the narrowness of his frame, nor the awkwardness of his posture. I would. And if I win? Believe me when I say that this fact saddens me, but I cannot allow you to return to Réans. The city walls are nigh impenetrable as is, but with you behind them, an impossible prospect. He lowered his gaze for a moment, before meeting Yarrow's eyes. Still, are you not curious? Yarrow rolled his neck, flexing his fingers and arms as he met Thelus' stare. He had already decided to kill the man the moment he saw him walk out beside an iron lancer. To do so in a duel, without the interruption of his bodyguards, would only make it sweeter. I accept. The battle for the four pillars raged on, but the sound was dim, as if some distance away. Yarrow rolled his shoulders and felt the comforting grip of his sword between his hands. As sharp as winter's touch, and as unbreakable as the spires that surrounded them. His mind was focused now, dedicated to the task at hand. He'd deal with what followed after. If he could fight his way past the guard, he might be able to save some of his regiment from annihilation. But that would have to wait. He muttered a brief prayer to Urin and walked out to meet his opponent. Thelus seemed calm and relaxed as he strode across the field. His sword hung loosely by his side, his step light against the snow. When he was a few paces away from Yarrow, he shifted his stance, his eyes gleaming from behind his raised sword. Yarrow moved into his own stance, his sword angled away from his hips as he stepped toward his opponent, testing his response, but keeping well out of range of Thelus's long reach. The lord circled slowly around Yarrow, his eyes shifting from the captain's feet to his hands, but never meeting his eyes. Traitor. Yarrow sprung forward, his sword a blur of steel in his hands. He sliced down into Thelus's guard before bouncing back and sweeping out at his legs. Thelus responded immediately, brushing aside the first blow and skipping over Yarrow's follow-up before slashing out at the captain. Yarrow flicked the strike away, feeling the gentle hum of steel vibrating in his hands as he stepped back. The Lord eyed him coolly, returning to his favoured stance as he continued to circle, pacing slowly through the snow. The opening exchange had decided nothing, with either swordsman testing the other's abilities, but not yet willing to risk a full confrontation. Thelus was fast, perhaps as fast as Alina. He favoured his left side, but his long reach made it difficult for Yarrow to take advantage. Thelus swung at him from overhead, using his reach to his advantage and forcing Yarrow to take another step back, his sword missing him by inches, cutting deep into the snow. Yarrow pressed forward as the sword arced past him, skipping across the ground in a few short strides before thrusting at his head. He dropped out of the way with surprising agility before kicking out at him with his left boot. The blow connected with his chest plate, pushing him back before he could press the attack any further. Yarrow twisted nimbly on his feet as Thelus whipped his sword at him, fast and furious as the Lord searched for an opening. He rolled his shoulders, moving quickly out of the way, and weaved past the flurry of blows, his sword already thrust out before him. Thelus grunted as the blade cut a groove through his pauldron, scoring the flesh beneath. He expected him to fall back, to pull away from the assault, but he shrugged off the blow and came at him again, lashing out at Yarrow's legs. He fell back again, counting the seconds between each of Thelus's assaults. There was no pattern between them, no distinguishable rhythm that he could seek out and exploit. He could already tell the man was an expert swordsman. He handled his blade with cold efficiency, luring Yarrow in with quick forays before leaping back and buffeting him with his reach. But his movements were too precise, too finely calculated. He left no room for risk and took no chances. Usurper. Yarrow caught a glimpse of his bone claws beyond the iron guard, the black and white of their banner moving through the melee. A dozen hussars were trying to break through, to force their way past the regrouping lances. Arrows cut an accussion down, even as he watched. Another was slaughtered by pole arms as the skirmish lines piled into them from behind. It was a massacre. Murderer. He gritted his teeth as Thelus moved in on him with a flourish of neatly timed attacks. Their swords clashed in the centre of the field before he swept in low, angling to crowd him and mitigate his height advantage. Thelus lurched back, jerking down with his sword as Yarrow darted in, catching him on the side, but leaving nothing more than a dent on his armour. The hussar sprang at him again, but Thelus was too quick and slipped out of the way, leaving Yarrow's dangling sword swiping at thin air. He'd been bloodied now, and was more cautious of Yarrow's advances, but he was still so quick. Faster than Alina then, 
His sword chopped at him, hissing in the air as he danced back toward him. Yarrow rolled his wrists in time with a blow, deflecting the hissing strike with an easy flick, but Thelus was ready for it. He stepped in and swung once with the pommel of his blade, forcing Yarrow to stagger back. He swung again, smashing down with his hilt as Yarrow tried to step away. The sharp edge crashed into his helm, buckling the steel and sending him stumbling backwards. His ears were ringing, and warm blood flowed from beneath his helm, mingling with the hot sweat that lined his face. He shook his head as Thelus continued to circle him, lifting his sword instinctively to block another blow to his side. His movement was sluggish, and he only just managed to fend it off. Fatigue was creeping in now, the stiffness in his bones slowly returning. He couldn't match Thelus for pace, perhaps before the battle, but not now. Thelus knew it too. His movements became more relaxed, more confident as he circled the hussar. Thelus pressed home the advantage, lashing out with lightning-fast attacks that left Yarrow's arms trembling from the blows. He pushed back, trying to sneak through the assault, but Thelus wasn't having any of it. The lord snapped another strike at him, as fast as a snake, his sword cutting into Yarrow's forearms before Thelus was gone again, just out of reach. He twitched and gasped with every movement, a score of cuts and bruises lined his hands and face. Uren bellowed once more above, his roar a deafening chorus of thunder and steel. Thelus darted forward, moving low with his sword, so fast Yarrow could hardly follow. He lowered his guard to catch the coming blow, but Thelus shifted on his feet at the last moment, sweeping upwards as Yarrow jerked his sword back up to meet him. He was too slow. Thelus punched forward, slamming his sword into his chest before he had time to blink. He heard Bellus's angry calls behind him, heard the struggle of his old friend as he tried to push his way past the iron guard. It wouldn't matter. Yarrow fell to his knees with a sigh, his hand clutched to the gaping wound in his chest. The sword that had favoured him for so long fell by his side, never to be held by him again. He stared down into his fingers, a bemused look on his face as he watched the lifeblood flow from his body. Thelus moved across the snow to stand over him, a sad smile on his lips as he wiped his sword against Yarrow's arm. "'Your reputation is well earned,' he said as he sheathed his blade. "'You fought well.' Not well enough, Yarrow replied between deep, wretched breaths. It is no bad thing to die in the service of your king. Kurov's last words before an arrow meant for Behan had ended his life. But death it still was. How could there be honor in that? Yarrow tilted his head as Sumeru's panicked bellows ripped across the snow, her voice a strangled roar. He turned to wave her away, to motion to Bellus. They could still make a break for it. They could still warn the king. But Sumera was already bounding across the field, her eyes wild with madness. They'd kill her now, as surely as he would die. He tried to pull himself up from the ground, but his legs felt like wooden planks beneath him, the blood he needed to power them vacating his body in a steady stream. Thelus grunted as the Akashan hurtled toward them, stepping away from Yarrow even as the Iron Guard rushed to his defense. Too slow, said Yarrow as the deep thud of Sumera's pads against the earth grew louder. Thelus ignored him and drew his sword, clenching it between his hands as he stared down the Akashan. He didn't know whether to fight or run, but it didn't matter. Sumera would tear him apart either way. Yarrow barked out a bloodied laugh as Thelus's calm visage began to crack. He knew it too. There was fear in his eyes now, an emotion Yarrow thought he'd never see. His ever-present smile faded, and his tongue darted out between his lips in a nervous twitch. The guards were moving quickly toward them, their heavy set mounts racing across the snow. He felt hot breath on his back, thick fur rub against his open hand, and a flash of black. Sumera leapt past him, her giant claws already extended for the killing blow. Thelus tried to duck out of the way, moving in a blur of motion at the last moment, but he wasn't quick enough. Sumera adjusted mid-flight and slashed out, her razor-sharp claws slicing through the flesh of his face, sending him spinning into the snow. Then the Iron Guard were upon them, forming a wall of bodies between their master and the Great Akashan, flinging themselves at her as they went to Thelus's aid. It wouldn't be enough, Yarrow thought, even as the ache in his bones and the pain in his chest began to fade away. He closed his eyes and slipped into the deep night. You've been listening to The Black Assars by Mitchell Lutie. 
Performed by Scott Miller. Produced by Citadel Studios for Sentinel Creatives. Production copyright by Sentinel Creatives.